Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. I have a few announcements to share with you. Online giving is available through the church website using the member portal login. If you would have any questions about online giving, please contact the church office. The June edi edition of Table Talk magazine is available in the box outside of the entryway. We are still waiting on the copies of Our Daily Bread. When they become available, I will email the congregation. Fireside Chats will continue on Tuesday and Friday this week, as well as the Wednesday virtual prayer meeting. Pastor Ron has an exciting announcement for us. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I am delighted to announce that the Board of Elders has decided that it is time for us to return to worshiping on site here at Grace Church as a congregation starting next Sunday, June the 7th. You will be receiving a letter and an email in the next couple of days that includes more details as to what this is going to look like. But in short, we are going to hold two worship services each week starting next Sunday that allows us to worship together in a safe manner as much as we're able. Thank you so much for your prayers, and we covet your prayers for wisdom as we seek the Lord's direction for once again gathering as a congregation. Now with that in mind, just a few updates. We understand that not everyone will feel immediately comfortable worshiping in person. And please understand that this is not to be seen as a matter of faith, as in you are neither more or less spiritually mature if you choose to attend or worship at home. This is a voluntary matter. So if you choose to continue to worship at home, here are just a few important things to note. The online service next Sunday morning will be available on our website at 10.30 a.m., this is a change from previous weeks, so just take notice. It'll be there on the, on the website at 1030. And we will continue to post the sermon, either audio only or video, as we normally do. So once we start live streaming, you'll still be able to view or listen to the sermon. You don't just have to be there right at that specific time. And now, with that out of the way, um, let's hear a call to worship. I almost want to say, would you, would you rise for the call to worship? That's next week, but we will do that next week. Our call to worship this morning is Revelation 19, 5 through 7. Praise our God, all you servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Hallelujah, for our, the Lord, our God Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him the glory. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, that's what we want to do. Only you are worthy of glory, and we want to give you the glory to which you are so richly deserving. We praise you, our God. We, we fear you. We respect you. We want to be in your presence. We want to sit under the teaching and preaching of your word. So hear us, Lord, that, and know that these are your children. We come together, to, and we seek your face. Guide us in this time of worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Acts. We've been studying uh, the first and second chapters of Acts together. And I'm going to read, picking up where we were last week, starting with chapter 1, verse 12. And then I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, and then we'll pray together. So Acts 1, starting in verse 12, continuing all the way to verse 26. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And Peter said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, 
who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas had turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Thus far the word of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, even as we examine this text, we know that so much truth is here that you indeed, Heavenly Father, know the hearts of all. Know our hearts today, Lord, and examine our hearts and know that we desire to worship you. We are so thankful for all the good things that you have done for us. Sometimes we are guilty, Lord. We are so guilty of taking you for granted, but every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, comes from you, from the greatest thing to the things that seemingly are easy to skip past and notice. We, we live and move and have our being by your leave. Every breath we take comes from our gracious, loving, merciful, beneficent Father. And so we praise you. We adore you, Lord. We thank you for who you are and for all that you have done for us even simply sustaining us through another week. Lord, we know that these are difficult times, but we look not to the times. We look to the great God of the times. You have a purpose for all things. And we have seen so many times over the last days and weeks how you have used even difficult circumstances to, to grow our faith, to teach us character qualities that you find desirable in us so that we can be more and more conformed to the image of your Son. Lord, we ask that you would grant us strength. Grant us strength that we can be the salt and light that we are called to be. So we can be light in a, in a lost and dark world. So many, Lord, we know are without the hope of Jesus Christ. And we have that hope. May we shine. We're also called to be salt that flavors and preserves a, a, a world that knows nothing of Jesus, well, may we flavor and preserve that world, not just with a set of moral codes, but with the glorious gospel. Lord, we delight to, to be in your presence, and we know that's true every week, but we especially want to be here today, all of us, mind, body, soul. So guard against distractions, Lord. Um, may, the, may the evil one not have a presence in this place. Um, May we be firmly focused on your word and on your glory. And Lord, we do ask for your guidance, uh, your wisdom as we make preparations for next Sunday when, Lord willing, we will be able to open these doors and gather again for worship. That is going to be such an exciting day. Keep us safe, Lord. We think of our brothers and sisters who are uh, experiencing great trial. We thank you for those who have gone through trials. We think of our sister Joetta and know that she's come through surgery this week and she praises you. We just ask, Lord, that you would uh, cause her to regain strength day by day, little by little, according to your perfect will. We pray for others who are experiencing uh, either physical or economic hardship, and we pray that you would be with them in, in very personal and comforting ways. We especially lift up those who are mourning. We have many in our flock who are mourning the loss of loved ones. May you hold them close as only you can. May you provide comfort as only you can and lift them up 
and help them to trust in you even through times of pain and suffering. And now, Lord, we ask that you would be up with our brother. Give him power from on high. May he proclaim your word with every confidence that your word always goes out with power, always accomplishes the purposes for which you send it. And may we eagerly receive it. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I'm Tim Radcliffe, the assistant pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. I'm glad to be able to bring you the word this morning. Uh, as Pastor Ron has already mentioned, our text for the sermon is going to be Acts chapter 1. We'll be starting in verse 15 uh, and continuing through the end of the chapter. But as we get going, I'd like to pray before we start. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we hear your word this morning, we would be not hearers only, but that we would be doers of your word. So we pray that you would empower us by your spirit to obey what we hear. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. My kids watch a cartoon on PBS. It's called Peg Plus Cat. In this show, the little girl and her talking cat, they solve problems using math. In every episode, something goes wrong in this little girl's life. And she gets to a point where she exclaims, we've got a really big problem. Now, the majority of the show is then this little girl and her talking cat using math to solve these problems. And by, the, by the end of every episode, she's able to say, the problem is solved. We solve the problem, so everything is awesome. The problem is solved. Now don't worry, today is not a math lesson, although numbers will factor in at some point as we look at our passage. But Peg plus Cat, well, they're on to something. Not much, actually, but they're on to the formula that we see present here in this passage. After several days of prayer, the Apostle Peter comes to a conclusion. He, he comes to a conclusion that we have a really big problem. And so what is the problem? Well, that's only part of the, part of the question. Because once we know what the problem is, we really have to ask, how do we solve this really big problem? That's what we see going on here in this passage. And so as we work through this, this text, we're going to see this really big problem and then how this problem comes to be solved. The really big problem. Let's start by looking at the really big problem that Peter has identified. He, he identifies it fairly early on in our passage in verses 16 and 17. And the author, Luke, he, he adds a few more details for those who are unfamiliar with the plight of Judas. Well, the problem that the church has is that one of the disciples of Jesus betrayed him to death. And then this disciple fled from the rest, and, and ultimately he ends up taking his own life. This is a big problem. But why is it a problem? There's, there's really a couple of reasons. The first is, as we look at the situation, we, we have to look at the situation that the apostles and the early Christians find themselves in. They've been given this, this great time with Christ over a 40-day span where he taught them and, and helped them to understand the kingdom of God. But now he has, he's gone back to heaven and, and he's told them to take the good news of the kingdom of God and to, to spread it to the very ends of the earth. How are they going to accomplish this great task? Pastor Ron started preaching about that last week, and, and he focused on, on those first few verses, verses 12 through 14. The apostles recognized that they could not do this on their own. They needed help from God to understand their part and also to empower them for this mission. But then, I think as expected, they begin to look around the room they look at the people that are gathered and, and they realize something. They're down a man. They've been given this enormous task, this great mission, and, and yet they're missing one of their number, one who had been with them from the beginning, one who knew them best. They were already going to be stretched thin to accomplish the commission from Jesus, but, but now they have to do it with 11 instead of 12 apostles. Well, yes, we, we see this mentioned in verse 15 that there are about 120 believers there. It's not just the apostles. 
But all those who are there are looking to the apostles for wisdom and guidance and, and for leadership. They're looking to them, and I, I think it's pretty natural for the apostles to realize that one problem with Judas's betrayal and, and now his absence because of his death, it's that they're short-staffed. But this isn't the only problem, and it's, it's not even the biggest problem that Judas represents. Judas could have been a 12th apostle to give guidance and, and help along with the others, but, but really it's his betrayal that hits very close to home. I just listen to these references to Judas just in the passage that we read. In, in verse 16, Judas became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Verse 18, he bought a field with the reward for his wickedness. Verse 20 says, may his camp become desolate. And verse 20, 25 says, Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Peter looks around, he sees Judas' absence, and he recognizes that the, the problem is not just that their number is down to 11. No, the betrayal of Judas, it stings deeply, and, and this is in the forefront of the minds of the apostles. Verse 17 it gives us a little bit of a hint, too. It shows us why this is such a big problem. It says, he was numbered among us, and, and he was allotted his share in this ministry. And yet, this one who was among us and who was allotted his share in the ministry, he's the one who betrayed Jesus. He's the one who betrayed all of them. The loss of Judas is, is not just a loss of a 12th disciple. It's a constant reminder of the pain and the wickedness that can arise even within a group as close as the disciples were. And this is the lesson that that the church continues to deal with throughout its life. It doesn't stop here. Paul writes in, in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, that Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 2, verse 19, There were some who went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. This is the problem that Peter and the other apostles faced. And, and when, we, when we see it in this light, we can see that this problem is not limited to the disciples. This is a problem that has plagued the church from its very beginning. But it's a problem that sticks with the church to today. There are those who claim to be with us, who are even allotted their share in the ministry, and yet, because of their own hearts, their own false motives and, and sinfulness, they, they have turned to their own way. They've gone to their own place. And in doing so, have even done great harm to the ministry of the gospel. Whether it's someone that you knew personally, or maybe someone that you looked up to from afar, I'm, I'm sure that each one of us can think of an example. An example of a Christian that we've known who because of their sin and, and shrinking back from the truth of the gospel have done harm to the gospel. And when we see this happen in the world around us, when we see it happen to those that we know and those that we care about, we see in some small way the, the pain and the confusion that the apostles experienced at this time. These situations that we face today, they, they may not be to the same extent as Judas's betrayal of Jesus, but there are certainly similarities when we see church leaders falter and, and betray the faith that they used to claim. And I think that as we see it this way and, and really think through the context of what Peter is saying here in Acts 1, we, we start to see that this problem is, is not as simple as Peter suggesting that he had an ideal number of apostles in mind and we should really get to that number. No, this is a crisis of leadership a crisis of trust in the church. This is a really big problem. The way to solve the problem. So what should the church do? How can this problem be solved? Well, Peter gives the answer. He, he shows the church the way to solve this really big problem. This is a description of, of what Peter did. This is, this is what we have here in these verses. 
I want to suggest to you that it's more than just a description of what Peter did, though. This really is a, a prescription for the way that the church should solve this type of problem. What did Peter do to solve the problem? Well, the passage that we're studying today, it starts out with these words in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The first question that comes to our mind should be, in which days? Well, this is why we read last week's passage in connection with this morning's during our scripture reading. The days in which Peter stood up to address this really big problem, they're the days when the apostles and the women and the other believers were gathered together and devoting themselves to prayer. With one mind, with one purpose, these early believers prayed to understand God's will and, and for the grace and strength to follow God's will. And it's, it's through this time of prayer and communion with God and with the rest of the church that Peter understands the problem and, and how it should be solved. But even as they're devoted to prayer and, and praying through this, it, it seems that prayer is not the only thing happening during this extended gathering. Of course, that's, that's the main thing that's going on, but, but what are they praying about? What's in their hearts and minds? What's guiding them in their prayers, and, and where are they getting their answers from? See, directly connected to this prayer, a life of prayer is, is a, a life of study and meditation of God's word. Now, I mean, the question could come up, what does that look like in this early church? Did they all have their Bibles open on their laps during this prayer meeting? That seems almost certainly untrue. The answers to that question, though, range from anything from they had a scroll of the Old Testament to they had just strips of what we would consider to be verses or passages. It might be the case that they didn't have any written scripture at all, that what they were thinking about, what they were praying over, was what they had memorized throughout their lives. Regardless of, of the way that they are studying scripture, though, what becomes clear as Peter speaks is that he's been thinking through these psalms. He's been meditating on these psalms. And he's even been praying through them, I think. And he's so filled with scripture during this time of prayer that, that scripture and, and scriptural principles, that's what flows out of his mouth when he comes to speak. And this is not the last time that we see this from Peter either. And then the very next chapter, Peter gives a wonderful sermon that is just overflowing with Scripture. As Peter prays and, and as the apostles and, and church are gathered together for prayer, Peter's mind is also filled with Scripture. So much so that any answer to his prayers, any answer to his questions, they're going to be answers that come from Scripture. In Acts chapter 1, it is, it is evident that the apostles' mission is on their minds, what Jesus had just told them to do. But it's also apparent by what Peter says that Judas is on their minds as well. And so as Peter prays about these two things, as he works through what the scriptures teach, he comes to the conclusion that, that scripture has already given the principles for how to solve the problem that they are facing. So where does, this, where does this leave us? Read the Bible and pray. That's not a very original idea, is it? It doesn't sound very profound. In fact, if, if we're being really honest with ourselves, that answer might even sound to be inadequate to the big problems that we face. But if it sounds inadequate to us, I would suggest that the issue is with our studying and praying and not with the Bible or with the God we pray to. I'm reminded at this point of, of Psalm 119. It's a long psalm. but Just listen to a few of the verses. Psalm 119 says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. And if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is this the way that we read God's word? Do we see it as, as a light to our path each day? 
Do we see it as, a, as wonderful and, and as dear to us as our very breath? Have we taken God's word into our hearts that we might not forget it? And do we know it? Do we recite it? Do we meditate or, or contemplate it all the day long? Reading your Bible is, is probably not a magic cure for getting all the answers to all of your problems. But God's word is profitable and useful for, for teaching and for training in righteousness. And it contains answers to the ultimate questions in life. In addition, it also gives wisdom and discernment to those who search for it. This is what Peter and those early Christians were doing. They were seeking in God's word for wisdom and for answers. For answers about what he would have them do. They were in deep and, and prayerful consideration of what God's word meant and, and how they could apply it in their lives. And so we too must seek out God's word to prayerfully and, and thoughtfully consider its meaning and how to apply what it teaches to our lives. We can't look at the example of Peter in this passage and, and say, what a strange segue from the ascension of Jesus to Pentecost. Why, why does this story just get thrown in here? No, when Peter is faced with this really big problem, the way to solve this really big problem is to seek the answer from God through his word and through communion with him in prayer. See, when you have a problem, you have to recognize that only God can solve this problem. So what we see is that the solution Peter comes to through meditation on God's word and, and through prayer, this conclusion is exactly correct. He rightly understands the Psalms of David to be Psalms fulfilled by Jesus, and in particular, these verses by Jesus' betrayer. So Peter, with, with this understanding in mind, that's when he comes to the conclusion, let another one take Judas's place. This solution, prayerfully arrived at with biblical principles, it answers both aspects of the really big problem of Judas. The problem is solved. At this point, I want to read for us again the solution that they come to for this really big problem, starting in verse 21. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The solution to the problem of Judas is to fill his spot with one who is qualified, and two qualified men were found in their company. Their names were put forward, and, and then the people prayed even more. They prayed for guidance once again, and, and they chose one of them to take on this vital role. That's not entirely true, though, is it? They, they didn't choose. They trusted that the Lord had already chosen, and they were simply to recognize the one that he had chosen. I suppose the American way to do it would have been a proper vote, but that really wasn't necessary. Choosing by lot was a much more common and accepted practice from the Old Testament and also from the culture of the first century. But also a vote was not needed because both of the men met the qualifications and either one of them would serve God well in this position. So this is the solution to the problem, but I, I think it's worth our time to consider how this solves the problem. The way that this solves the problem is, is by addressing the leadership whole in two ways. First is that it brings the number of apostles back to its rightful number, the number of 12. It's perhaps too simplistic to think of this as a math problem, but there is a problem with the math. Jesus had chosen 12 to be with him, and, and he had chosen them for a purpose. The number 12 is a very significant number. It, 
should not be missed that Jesus chose these 12 disciples in part because of the connection that it makes to the Old Testament and the 12 tribes of Israel. Commentator Derek Thomas points out that Jesus choosing 12 disciples is a way of continuing something that had its roots in the economy of the Old Testament, signaling a line of continuity from the Old to New Testament. And Peter, Peter in particular, may have found it important to maintain the number of 12 apostles, perhaps remembering a conversation he'd had with Jesus, which was later recorded in Matthew 19, verses 17 through 18. In that passage, Peter asked Jesus what the disciples would receive for leaving everything and following him. Jesus' reply was, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So it may not be only to have twelve apostles that Peter comes to this conclusion. But Peter does recognize that 12 were chosen for a purpose. And that purpose is not yet completed. Judas's place must be filled. But this leads directly to the second way that this solves the really big problem. Prayerfully choosing another qualified apostle, it properly establishes the foundation of the church on earth. The theme that we have been focusing on the last several weeks is that of the permanent prevailing church. That Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. One of the more surprising aspects of this passage, at least that I've found, is is that it directly applies to this study. I I think maybe the first time that I read this passage before having the opportunity to study it and and preach on it was, was maybe the thought of, really? This is the passage that Pastor Ron is giving to me to preach? Of course, I I should have known better. And in my time of study, I've I've understood that this passage actually serves as, as the linchpin, as the key to seeing how the disciples understood Jesus' promise of building his church and their working it out in real life. Derek Thomas, whom I just referenced, he also makes this point in his commentary. He sees a direct connection between Peter recommending a 12th apostle and Jesus promised to build the church made back in Matthew 16. Well, I've said that that's the case, and I've told you that one other commentator said that's the case, but but what is the evidence? I've already mentioned the connection that Jesus himself made between the 12 disciples and the 12 tribes of Israel. But if we go forward in time a little bit, we get this corroboration by Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. In Ephesians 2, Paul is is writing about the church, and, and as he does that, he writes these words. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. I'll see Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our faith. Paul writes about this not only in Ephesians 2, but also in 1 Corinthians 1. And and Peter adds to this discussion in 1 Peter chapter 2. It is Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension that stand as the cornerstone of the Christian faith. Without Jesus, there is no Christianity. For without his perfect life and death, we are still under God's wrath. And without his resurrection and ascension, we would have no hope that salvation could be applied to us. The greatest, the greatest and most important piece of all of Christianity is Jesus Christ. When you have a cornerstone, you have the most important piece of the building. What sets the the way for the rest of the building But if you have a cornerstone, you do not yet have a foundation. You only have the beginning. And Paul makes it crystal clear that the apostles are an integral part of the foundation of the church. Now, Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone and the builder. But he builds upon the foundation of the apostles. And so the foundation must be whole and strong. Jesus is is using these days these days between his ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit, he's using them to prepare the church for the mission that he has sent them on. 
He's going to make the foundation sure before starting to build upon it at Pentecost. And do we see what that means for us? For, for, for we who read this centuries later, it means that we have a Savior who can be trusted because he has not left us on our own. He's not left us to our own devices or our own cleverness. Now, building the permanent prevailing church, it's, it's not left up to us to figure out, but God takes an active part in preparing, strengthening, and building his church. When he told the disciples to become his apostles or, or messengers to the ends of the earth, he told them that he would send the Spirit. But even before he did that, he made sure that they were prepared, that they were set as a strong foundation so that the church could be properly built on top of it. We have to notice all along the way that the Lord has accomplished this. The Lord is doing this through the church's prayer and meditation on God's word. God used his people, their reading and, and meditating on his word and their prayers. He used that to strengthen and build the church and even to prepare the church for what was about to come at Pentecost. And this is the one who promised to build his church to the end of the age, the one who is still preparing his people, the one who still strengthens his people to carry out the mission that we see given in Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He is still building and strengthening his church, and he will never stop. As we come to a close, we need to remember that, that Peter was not the only one who's faced really big problems. We still face them today. It, there, there are still times when, when leaders fail, when, when mentors fall into sin, when church members turn to their own way and go to their own place. But when we face these really big problems, it is, it is such an encouragement and such a comfort to know that God has a plan for building and strengthening his church. He has a plan for that, and, and we understand it through prayer, through studying God's word. Through prayer and, and studying God's word, we can understand his plan and we can see his purpose knowing that he will continue to work and continue to strengthen us as his church. To bring back the, the jingle from the cartoon I mentioned at the beginning, the problem is solved. God solved the problem. So the problem is solved. It's not us. It's not our own wisdom. It's not our own plans. But it is God who works through us. And so may we be diligent in our prayer and, and in our study of Scripture, just as the early church was when they faced difficulty. Because we know that the Lord will build His church, that nothing can stand in His way. So let us seek out His will through His Word and how He would have us serve as His ambassadors to accomplish His mission to the end of the age, just as he has promised. Let's pray. God in heaven, we pray that you would empower us for this task, that you would use your word to give us answers, that we would seek for answers from your word, that as we pray to you, as we seek answers to life's questions and problems, that you would reveal them to us through your word. Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us your word, and that you have promised to never leave us, and you have promised to continue to build your church. We trust in that and ask that you would help us to be faithful ambassadors for you as we continue on the mission to take the good news of the gospel and the kingdom of God to the very ends of the earth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And now receive the benediction. May the God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places give you grace and peace. Amen.